Once more, I am Garrett Treberg, APA Nevada Southern Section Director, welcoming you to our second event of the year covering Las Vegas Ranger Stadium District Plan. Uh, again, at the top of our list, keep your mics muted, please. The session will be recorded uh, on YouTube or going to YouTube. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, uh, log to get your credits logged. You can email me, GTB, George Tom, on book at, here at uh, ClarkCountyNV.gov. Name and APA number. Uh, put your questions in the chat for uh, responses by the speaker, who is Jared Tasco. I will now introduce him. Uh, he is uh, with um, Clark County Comprehensive Planning, grew up in Boulder City, Nevada, attended the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he obtained a Bachelor of Science in Architecture and a Master of Public Administration. He has worked for Clark County since 2006 and currently a principal planner in the current planning division where he reviews complex land use applications like this and leads planning commission meetings uh, where he reviews, uh, okay, so, and Jared also enjoys outdoor recreation, including running, biking, and hiking. So without further ado, take it away, Jared. All right. Thanks, Garrett. Appreciate the introduction. Let's take off my mask and uh, start sharing my screen. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. All right, hopefully you can see my screen. So getting started, uh, we really were presented with a unique opportunity here in Clark County. Um, we learned probably about the same time as everybody else that we were gonna be getting an NFL stadium in our jurisdiction. So that was pretty exciting. And so at that time, um, petitioned the managers and the leaders in my department that we should do a, a plan for that area and use, utilize it as a catalyst to help re-envision the district. So after some persuading, they agreed, and um, I'm very fortunate that uh, we were able to move forward with the project. And that's also in thanks to RTC. Um, so this was done in conjunction with RTC. And so they, this project is made up of two components. Um, the county funded the land use component, and RTC funded the transportation component. So we worked together on it. Um, we led the plan, but so there's really those two aspects of the project to um, re-envision the area. So with that, uh, we were able to hire, hire uh, the team of consultants. So Raffi Architecture is out of Henderson. Uh, they did the land use component of the plan. And Atkins International did the transportation component, along with uh, Kimley Horn, who did some of the data analysis for the traffic movement in that area. And then probably most of you guys are familiar with Paceline Consulting, that's Jacob Snow. He helped us with public outreach, as well as Erica Avelias helped with the public outreach as well. She came in here and she said my computer got hacked. So just to orient everybody, the stadium district is on the west side of the I-15, the south part of the strip. Um, so you have Mandalay Bay and the Luxor over on um, the east side of the I-15. The northern boundaries are Tropicana Avenue, and then the west and the south are the Union Pacific Railroad, and the east is the I-15. This is the area that we designated that we really wanted to evaluate. It's mostly an industrial area so far, but we knew that the stadium is going to create a lot of changes in that district. And so we wanted to analyze it and see, you know, what we can do on our end if we should make any changes for land use and um, development purposes. So with that, we developed four <coughs> guiding objectives that we wanted to accomplish uh, with this plan. So overall, first and foremost, it was a envisioning document, a vision document. We wanted to find out if the area should stay industrial. It's a successful industrial district that performs many warehousing, distribution, automotive related um, services for the resort corridor as well as the rest of um, the urban area. And so, you know, so we didn't want to disrupt that, but if we do uh, get our stakeholders together, um, property owners, developers, real estate agents, should we consider something different now that we're going to have a stadium in this district? With that, after we develop our vision, what is going to be the toolbox of solutions that we're going to use to help implement that vision? We also wanted to identify potential investments. And then this last one was key, which really worked out well because of the timing um, to inform the Transform Clark County Master Plan and Development Code Rewrite. So here at the county, we're simultaneously going through an update to our land use uh, comprehensive master plan. And then that's going to lead right into a development code rewrite for Title 30. So it's an exciting opportunity to do those simultaneously. And it worked out really well with the timing of this because we're going to finish up in June 
and then we'll be able to take the recommendations from this vision document and this plan, hand it off to our team of consultants that are rewriting Title 30, and they'll be able to incorporate some of the recommendations into an overlay district and um, design overlay area for that district. So this is an overview of the planning process um, that we use to help guide us through um, this project. Initially, we collected data, researched best practices, and identified those key stakeholders in the initiate phase. And then we explored um, different alternatives, identified the stakeholder expectations. And this is where we developed the vision for the document as well. We looked in the different land use scenarios, did a SWOT analysis. And then after that, we created some concepts uh, for the potential solutions to the area. We presented those through several different uh, formats, online meetings. Of course, we dealt with COVID during that time, so we had to adjust and transition a lot of our public outreach to online. And then right now we're in between the validate and deliver phase. So we're right finishing up um, our final recommendations um, for the plan. We just closed you know, a week or two ago our uh, last final public input process. And so we incorporated all of the feedback that we received. We're incorporating that into the final document. And then I, I'll show you at the end of this presentation what our upcoming meetings are going to be to present the plan to the appointed and elected officials. This is an overview of the engagement activities um, that we did. So we created a project website. We got over 750 survey responses that we were pretty happy with. So we collaborated or combined all of that data together and that helped inform what we wanted to do with the plan. We held four stakeholder meetings, um, like I said, with um, business owners, developers, real estate agents, people from different government agencies, Metro, the airport, UNLV, and brought everybody together and really got their input and, and used that to help guide our vision and the development of this plan. We held a pop-up meeting uh, at a UNLV football game. Of course, that was prior to COVID. And then we've uh, presented at several different professional and business association meetings including this one at EPA. And this has been about a three year process. You can see we started in late 2018 and we're finishing up you know, mid 2021. So our first public outreach meeting, our stakeholder meeting, this is a photo from that um, event. We held it at the RTC building here um, in Southern Nevada. You can see we got out the Legos, we got out different um, colored pieces of felt paper to represent different land uses. And we had a lot of fun with the different stakeholders and getting a diverse input of opinions on what they thought we should develop around that stadium. And so with that, some of the key items that came out of the meeting were that people wanted to you know, see a, a family friendly area, incorporate more public open spaces, have more of a mixed use community, and address the infrastructure. And of course, you know, parking is a big item as well. And I should mention that regarding parking, this is long term for redevelopment for that area. So how those uses and property owners are going to redevelop in that district, what we can do to adjust those regulations to help um, fulfill the vision that we established. Um, but at the same time, the Raiders and the stadium board, they have their own parking and event management plan for event days. So we're not involved in that, although we did review it and we addressed it and it informed our plan. Uh, long term for that area. So one of the other things we looked at was the existing conditions. And so it's a kind of a unique opportunity. It, it has been a successful area, but it, it's an industrial area and it's fulfilled that purpose. It has large blocks, uh, big warehouse spaces um, that accommodate distribution um, services, warehouses. And so that being said, it's good to handle truck traffic and vehicles, but it's maybe not ideal for all the pedestrians that are going to be walking through that area once the stadium is up to uh, full capacity. And you can see it's really um, not well connected. So there are aspects of that district where streets um, do not go through, they've either been vacated or they were not required to dedicate um, when those projects developed. So it's pretty much all built out, but that creates some obstacles for us as we go through, we're trying to create a more connected area. One item of interest is the little pop out in the lower right hand corner of your screen. So that's at the corner of Diablo and Procyon. And the Raiders themselves are going to make that connection. There's already an easement going through there. Right now it's blocked off with a chain link fence and some barbed wire. But 
you know, when, all, when it's all finished, that's going to be a nice pedestrian connection to the west side of the stadium. So then we can utilize the Raiders, you know, um, west of that area for parking, pick up and drop off, especially for uh, transportation network companies. So here's another, like, some more examples of the existing conditions in the district. You can see we really designed it. You know, it's designed, it meets our code requirements. We have the five foot sidewalk. We have, you know, landscaping behind the sidewalk, um, you know, but it might not be the most comfortable area for pedestrians. Obviously it's designed for vehicles. You have to a little bit, you know, some scary underpasses and also in the lower left-hand side of your screen, um, some areas where street lights, there's gaps um, in the lighting. So that could create some safety issues. And so this, you know, it's good for transporting vehicles. Um, the occasional pedestrian, but it's not the best design if you're going to accommodate, you know, tens of thousands of people walking through that area and give them a comfortable, enjoyable experience. So with all of our stakeholders um, in the room together and then some input from online surveys, this is the vision that everybody agreed upon. We want to create a dynamic district with a comprehensive mix of uses that supports the continuation of current businesses while providing opportunities to transition into a thriving destination for entertainment, hospitality, business, and sports. So we really wanted to make it a point that we're not trying to um, diminish or take any opportunities away from those indi um, existing industrial businesses, but we understand there are going to be demands there for more entertainment, um, commercial, um, dining options around that stadium. And how do we make those two uses you know, work together and provide opportunities for that in the future while um, understanding the current industrial uses there that want to remain. So in order to implement that vision, uh, we establish four goals. We want to provide flexibility within the built environment to accommodate both event day and non-event day functions. This is probably a good point to pause too that, you know, there's going to be a catalyst there, obviously drawing people when we have the major events, but we wanted to study and understand and get some ideas of what could draw people there on non-event days. We don't want those restaurants and businesses, you know, to thrive when there's an event at the stadium and then, you know, have no business at all on the other days of the year. So really taking that into consideration of how do we have a year round active, vibrant space in the stadium district. We wanted to provide connectivity and access throughout the district. So that goes um, in terms of connecting some of those streets and providing, you know, additional access and alternative modes of transportation. So not just focus on vehicles, but uh, buses, bicycles, um, you know, ride sharing as well. Enhance the quality of life by creating a vibrant district with best practices for urban design. And so I'll get into this. We have some examples um, on future slides of creating more of that main street feel of bringing the buildings to the back of the sidewalk, creating a comfortable pedestrian environment, um, getting away a little bit from the suburban design practices of setting those buildings back behind parking lots. It isn't the best experience for pedestrians. And also similar to our vision, um, accommodating both uh, businesses to remain and also transition to new uses. So with that, uh, we went through an envisioning land use exercise. Um, this was a lot of fun. This goes back to when we had the Legos and the felt pads and um, we got people's input. And what they more or less came up with was they envisioned more of a concentration of retail, restaurant, hospitality type uses around the stadium. And then it kind of radiated in a gradient fashion outward towards the Union Pacific Railroad on the west and the south, where then it maintained or um, more of the industrial uses as a buffer against those uh, railroad line and the railroad spur out to Henderson. And also some of the other things that we had to take into consideration. So this map represents the airport environs. Um, McCarran Airport is located just across I-15 to the east of the area of the stadium district. And so one of the things that you can see is it's um, underneath the flight path for the planes. And so we're very sensitive. We don't want to promote any additional residential uses underneath the flight path. Um, doesn't create a good experience for people trying to live there with the noise and it's not good for airport operations. Um, with the complaints and things that they receive. So you can see really if we did want to incorporate residential, the only option would be the northern part of the district district outside of that kind of pink um, oranges, orange colored areas. 
So this gets to our goal of having you know best um, urban design principles. And you can see the buildings would be built back to the sidewalk, have a more comfortable pedestrian environment, activate that space on the ground floor with windows, and retail, and shopping opportunities, um, and also promoting some rooftop gardens and patios. You know, I think that obviously that really activates the space, kind of like Mill Avenue down in Phoenix. You have activity going on on the ground level as well as up above and really makes an exciting um, area for people to walk and enjoy. Public art and open space uh, really helps create a sense of identity for an area. You can see these spaces as examples um, really draw you in as places that you want to spend time and go and enjoy. And so we wanted to incorporate a public art component into the district. Um, we've done that along Maryland Parkway and so that's we're kind of figuring that out um, and that's gone well so far. And so we could do something similar in this district, um, but these are some examples of items to incorporate in that area. So the block development, like I mentioned, these are some of the large blocks in that district. And so this is really gonna create an obstacle for you know, vehicles as well as pedestrians trying to traverse the area and getting from one area to the stadium um, it also limits the amount of commercial opportunities because the more street frontage you have, the more retail opportunities and dining options you have um, adjacent to those pedestrian corridors. So on the left, you see it's not easily walkable. Um, we do want to study different areas to increase the permeability. And one way that we're going to try to accomplish that is by requiring easements for pedestrians when people come in to redevelop. Um, we're going to study the transportation element, um, but I don't know if there's really any opportunities there to require more street dedication. Uh, I think that, that boat may have sailed um, when that area already developed, but when projects do come in and redevelop, we can require them to provide at least a pedestrian path through their site um, to help improve that connectivity and that permeability in some of these larger blocks. Um, so at least we'll have that for pedestrians, even if we don't have that necessarily for um, vehicles long term. Uh, so these are some of the key elements for the block development, obviously pushing the buildings out to the perimeter um, of the blocks uh, rather than and having the buildings um, surround the sidewalks adjacent to that area rather than parking spaces. That allows for the parking and driveways to be more internal to the blocks, as well as open up areas for pedestrian pathways and open space opportunities. So some complete streets examples, you know, everybody's favorite example in Southern Nevada is the district in Henderson, you know, they did a great job, it's pedestrian friendly, uh, retail establishments, dining options there, use that as an example of things that we can strive for, but, you know, just to provide, you know, to show a different um, option for the future in this area. All right, so now we get into the, the fun design components of um, the district. This is where you can see the street network on the right hand side of the screen. It might be a little hard to tell, but some of the dashed lines, those all represent future connections. So if we were able to um, finish off that grid, it can be a really well connected area. Um, and along with that, we created a different hierarchy and different street typology for the different streets that would serve different functions in that district. You can see the red lines um, going north and south and then east and west for Russell Road and Valley View. Those are our largest streets in the district, the multimodal um, streets that are going to uh, accommodate a large number of traffic. So we have some design solutions for those. Um, internal to um, the grid network, we have the neighborhood street, which we use most frequently. Frequently, That's kind of the orange, uh, yellowish color. Uh, the festival streets, we created an opportunity that we thought would be most appropriate if people wanted to do farmers markets craft fairs or things like that. And we have some design um, solutions that would help accommodate those types of uses. And you can also see the pedestrian pathway, um, the crosses um, internal to each block. And so those are not necessarily prescriptive that we have to have you know, right angles of a pedestrian pathway through the center of the block. It's more representative of the potential connections that may meander or you know, through a site, go into a building, outside of a building, as long as there's signage and a clear pathway that people can access through a site, it'll really help open up that area for more um, retail and hospitality type uses. And then I guess I should mention on the left side, uh, west of Valley View, the north-south red line, um, 
We anticipate that will mostly remain um, industrial for the time being in the future. So we left that as an industrial street cross section. So the next few, few slides, we pulled out some examples of some of the cross sections that we designed. This one I thought was kind of the fun part of the project. Um, I know my colleague Greg had a lot of fun there <laughs> checking all the, but we designed it. We made sure that all of the dimensions were accurate uh, for each one of the sections and that these you know, could be potential solutions uh, for that area. So the first one is a neighborhood street um, example. And this is kind of one of the more simple solutions that would not require a big infrastructure change. And we wanted to provide an option for our public works department that really only requires a change in paint color uh, within the right of way. So you can see across the top of the screen, the 60 foot ride wide right of way. Um, it's what you know, the county controls, it's in the public um, realm. Right now, that's just striped for vehicles, and that's the only thing that it um, accommodates. But you can see all the different uses that we can account for um, within that existing 60 foot right of way. So we have existing five foot wide sidewalks on either side of the street. Um, you could put in a four foot wide bike lane, on street parking, still maintain 11 foot travel lanes in each direction. And you're not changing the width of the right of way and you're not changing any different concrete or asphalt or anything, just changing striping. And so as the area redevelops, there'll be some sort of tipping point, we hope. So whether it's, say you have a street alignment and more than 50% of the industrial uses start to tran or transition or approved and developed as more commercial uses, then our public works department and we can look at it and reevaluate and say, okay, this is no longer an industrial area. This is now more a predominantly commercial hospitality area. More of these um, complete street solutions would be appropriate. And so we can't do it now. You know, it's all, all industrial in that district. Um, but at some point in the future, we hope that this is a viable alternative. So that describes the public realm. And then we also designed the component on each side of the street for uh, private property owners as they come and redevelop. So you can see to on the right hand side of the screen um, next to the tan sidewalk, you would have a five foot wide amenity zone with landscaping, a 10 foot wide walkway. Um, and then we would build the build, bring the buildings back to the back of the sidewalk. And so this creates a lot more of a comfortable environment. And so combined with maintaining the existing five foot sidewalk, the five foot amenity zone and the 10 foot wide um, clear path. You have 20 feet really essentially for pedestrians all without really changing too much. Um, not a substantial change, but it would be a lot more comfortable and help facilitate some of these different uses that we envision for the district. So this is an example of the festival street um, that I mentioned. So portions of Alibaba and Procyon be most appropriate. This obviously would require more of an infrastructure change. Um, one of the things that's I think is most interesting with this design is there's no curb separation between the street and the sidewalk. So we would still, this would help facilitate if people are wheeling, you know, carts to set up for booths for a farmer's market in and out of the street or going back and forth from the storefronts into the um, right of way and help close it down to uh, vehicle traffic. Um, you would have bollards and landscaping to separate um, the vehicles uh, from the pedestrian areas when the street is open to cars. And you would also have an activated median in the center. You can see it can be a refuge for pedestrians, but really helping make better use of some of the existing right of way that we have in that area now. It would be a lot more comfortable for people, you know, walking to attending uh, sporting events and concerts at the stadium. This is an example of the Main Street cross section. So we designated Hacienda Avenue, which runs east and west on the north side of the stadium as the Main Street for that district. So that's a wider right of way at 80 feet. And um, you can see we have a cycle track on, would be on the north side of the right of way. And it's something that would be in the right of way. Um, we'd move the sidewalk farther out into the street, but we'd still have you know, two travel lanes in each direction, 11 feet wide, along with the median. But this would be a lot more comfortable environment as well to help bring um, both bicyclists and pedestrians um, to the area and they can walk and bike uh, through the area as well. So that's the, and all, I should mention that each one of these, um, these are just one scenario of suggestions. None of this is going to be prescriptive. 
we just study different alternatives for each one of these streets. And we probably have three or four or more scenarios for each one of these streets. I just pulled out some of the examples that highlight some of the different components that we utilize to, um, to form our recommendation or form, you know, at least study in this report. And this is an example of alley view. You can just see the difference. I mean, uh, between the 60 foot road and 100 foot wide road is so wide. And I mean, it really makes it difficult, um, right? And this is even improved. I mean, this would have the five foot sidewalks moved in, but adding a bike lane on either side of the road because it is designated as um, uh, a bike path um, in the regional uh, plan for um, through RTC. So we wanted to incorporate that into at least some of our designs and create that as a potential scenario. We would also add the pedestrian realm on the private property on either side of the street cross section. So you can see that really would help separate out the pedestrians and the bikes, give them a little bit more safety um, and make it more comfortable as they travel along you know, uh, this main arterial that would accommodate um, you know, all the traffic. So these are a couple examples of the different pedestrian realm options that we provided. All of our, or most of our um, street cross sections just for consistency utilize the attached sidewalk scenario on the left hand side of the screen. So that all the sidewalks more or less are existing in the district now. And then we would just add that pedestrian, or excuse me, that amenity zone of landscaping with the five feet and then the 10 foot walkway uh, behind the existing sidewalk. But conversely as another option, um, if people are, developers are redeveloping the site and removing the sidewalk or doing more extensive redevelopment. Um, we could, we did propose an alternative that in lieu of the sidewalk adjacent to the right of way, you can replace it with landscaping, essentially have a detached sidewalk, which is similar to what we already do on collector and, and arterial streets in the county. This would combine that 15 foot area uh, for pedestrians and give them a lot uh, wider area to travel um, in, the, in the district. So some of the examples of the pedestrian pathways, like I mentioned, um, we don't have any alleys, but you know, I know the city of Las Vegas has done a great job with their alley program and promoting um, more vibrant uses of these spaces um, in the downtown Las Vegas area. But we do have paths that you know, are gonna evolve between buildings and areas that we can take advantage of and um, utilize for additional retail or dining space and just have that unique experience for pedestrians that are gonna be walking through that area to explore. So this map represents all the multimodal options through the district. So we have a bus route, we have um, the bike paths uh, running along Valley View Boulevard and Hacienda Avenue, which run down to Polaris. Um, and you can see the dashed lines for the potential connections that would um, help complete that grid. And one of the other things I wanted to point out on this is this also incorporates the potential Vegas loop option. And so that's um, you know, Tesla's um, Elon Musk's company for the boring company. And they are already op operational with the tunnels underneath uh, the convention center to transport passengers there. And currently we have in process um, going to a public meeting, the potential of extending that network underneath the Las Vegas Boulevard, connecting all the casinos or most of them, and then also extending east to McCarran Airport and west to connect some of these resorts um, on the west side of the Strip, the Rio, the Palms, as well as the stadium in New Orleans. And I don't know if anybody's watching uh, Saturday Night Live this weekend, but Elon Musk hosted it and he had a, and he mentioned the Boring Company. So I was really excited about that. I was like, <laughs> but he mentioned, I was like, yeah, the, the tunnel project, we're working on that in Vegas. So that was pretty cool to see that on Saturday Night Live. And then last, I have some just called out some of the potential strategies that we're going to use to help implement each of these goals. So obviously, these are things all that I mentioned previously in the slide, maintaining the industrial industrial uses um, along the Union Pacific Railroad, reduce the setback requirements for the building so that they're back um, behind the pedestrian realm, activate the pedestrian realm, you know, um, retail and commercial and office frontage. Um, have a multimodal street network. We didn't have any slides, but also as part of our report, we do have a section on wayfinding signage and uh, potential opportunities for that um, in the district. Uh, parking locations and accommodations for bicycle, improving the road design and infrastructure, um, connecting to transit. 
And then overall, just enhancing the user experience, you know, making it a lot more comfortable and safe for people um, in that area. Um, installed pedestrian scale lighting. You know, right now there's just the street lighting is intended for vehicles, not necessarily pedestrians. And then also incorporating um, security principles and uh, the crime prevention through environmental design um, aspects as well. And lastly, you know, we were looking at different options of helping to draw people there. And at least in the short term, you know, on non-event days, we can have events and, um, you know, in the streets, encourage temporary patios, retail vendors, um, kiosks for food vendors, as well as outdoor stages and music. Um, and then how eventually, you know, our infrastructure is gonna accommodate those different uses. So with that, these are our final steps for this uh, multi-year project. Uh, we, right now we're finalizing our, like I mentioned, our public comments on the draft plan. Uh, we have those revisions almost completed. And then uh, we're gonna be presenting to the Metropolitan Planning Subcommittee on May 11th um, at RTC, um, as well as the Executive Advisory Committee as RTC as well. And then on June 1st, we're gonna present to the Clark County Planning Commission, get their input, and then the next day present to the Board of County Commissioners and hopefully if they accept um, the final, our document with our vision for the area, then we can take some of these key components and recommendations and start working with the team that's um, doing our transform Clark County and updating our um, development code to help implement those changes uh, for future development in that area. So with that, we probably got a lot of time left. Um, we're happy, happy to answer any questions. We have questions. All right. Great for you to finish though. Well, cool. so are you ready for the first one? Sure. Okay, here we go. So, uh, yeah, so the first question talks about. Um, okay, so uh, it says, how did you determine your stakeholder list? Uh, you must have used a larger list than just property and business owners in the area. Remember? Yeah, we, uh, we actually. Greg, by the way, Greg Servin. Yeah, yeah, Greg yeah. Servin, uh, Clark County Conference of Planning. Um, so actually, part of our first initial survey, we tried to, to uh, see what kind of interest there was for people that wanted to be part of the stakeholder group. Um, so part of that survey, a lot of people were able to indicate whether they wanted to be part of that group, and uh, we took their information. But uh, the stakeholder group is more than just, uh, um, like you said, it's more than just property owners and business owners. It also includes local utilities, government agencies, uh, concerned citizens. Um, uh, also, we had some ULP representatives and uh, Las Vegas radio representatives. And we also had representatives from NIOP and uh, the Tropicana Business Coalition. So we had, we had a, a good uh, group, I guess, of uh, different interests as part of the group. Okay. Great. Uh, next question. Uh, okay, did you also study any other stadium districts of the country? Do you want to repeat yeah, yeah, repeat one more time. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Did you study any other stadium districts in the country? I know you mentioned a couple of them already. Yeah, I think our, our consultants they've looked at. Uh, I think we looked at Denver Mile High Stadium there. Well, I guess different name now. It's like uh, Power. I can't remember the exact <laughs> name, but um, and then uh, looked even. I even looked at some arenas. I think over near Sacramento, like it was like Golden One. Yeah. So I. It did, our network consultants did look over some of the, what has been done in some of the other areas and uh, try to apply what uh, what was learned from those projects to this project. All right, that's all our questions so far. Come on, everybody. Let's. I, I'm sure you have some more out there. So we'll wait a minute and see. Scott's got some questions. Oh, here it goes. Okay, yeah, here comes one. Okay. Oh, I just look at it yourself there, uh, Jared, or you want me to read it for you? <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, man, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I'll say it, I'll, I'll, I'll just read, I'll read the, the chat and respond. So, uh, yeah, uh, who won the, oh, okay, that's, uh, okay, never mind, that's, uh, that's uh, on, the, on the other side. Just for the record, Jerry is a graduate of UNLV, so there's a little robbery. Yeah, we got, we got that here. Uh, okay, we got, at least we have an NFL stadium. <laughs> okay, we have another question, it looks like we can answer here. Uh, will the county be pursuing any incentives to encourage redevelopment in the area? Um, I mean, the only incentives that we really can offer 
potentially would be through the design, through our application process. Um, similar to what we did at Maryland Parkway would be, you know, if there are ways, I, we're not, we didn't look at that specifically with this. We're gonna, probably going to get into that when we develop the overlay district. But, you know, the potentials for reducing parking, modifying some of the design standards, um, potentially doing more things administrative rather than taking them through a public hearing process. So those would be some of the incentives that we would be able to incorporate at our level. Okay. Um, looking for more questions that we can answer today. So please uh, step up and uh, ask your questions. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, all is, is all parking being handled by the Raiders, or are there some lots uh, such as rideshare being proposed by the county? Are all parking locations being included in the plan? Well, the Raiders they developed a pretty extensive parking plan. I know they're thinking about developing a co-op with other business owners to in order to increase the number of parking in the area. Um, to anticipate a lot of the people who might be parking at the resorts and either ride sharing or walking to the stadium. Um, and other property owners in the area, they, they're welcome to do use their area for parking because like I said, a lot of times the, their industrial spaces might not be used on Sundays. They, they can be able to use it for parking. So, um, but the, there is a pretty, the readers have been working on it a lot. They have a pretty substantial program in place. Yeah, and I don't think we showed it in our presentation, but in other aspects of the report, we do have all those parking lots identified. The pedestrian movement through that area and how that would be handled in terms of the stadium district. Okay. Here we go to the next one. What is the latest with the Hyperloop project? You mentioned it already, of course. Yeah. Uh, when would it be completed? Do you have any? Yeah, so, so far we have, there's three stations that are completed at the convention center. And so that's, they're finalizing that um, to help to accommodate upcoming conventions. I think the world of concrete is around the corner. So they're, that's, they're in a rush to finish that. We also have approvals to extend that to uh, Wynn Resort and Encore, and then also to Resorts World on the west side of Las Vegas Boulevard. So those are the two um, extensions so far that have been approved. And then there's two other applications that are pending. So Caesars Entertainment submitted an application, which is going to do a loop and connect um, all of their project, all of their casinos and resorts on the east side of the Las Vegas Boulevard. And then we have a larger uh, Vegas loop, uh, Hyperloop project um, that Scott mentioned, which is going to connect all of these different tunnels together with districts on the west side. So the two that are still pending are the Caesars loop and the Vegas loop, and those have been submitted, reviewed, um, gone to town board. However, there's um, some other details that are still being worked out. So they're currently on hold. Um, they've been scheduled to for uh, the Board of County Commissioners uh, several times, but it's it's been held now. And so uh, that that final hearing and whether it gets approved or denied or, or modified should be coming up pretty soon. But in terms of that's just the land use component and the entitlement aspect of it. I don't know how long it would take them potentially after that to complete it. But if it's any indication like the um, uh, convention center, they built that really fast. I mean, by the time they got that approved, they put that boring machine in the ground and dug the tunnel surprisingly fast. I was pretty impressed. Okay, thank you. Okay, have you had any interest from the development community for projects in the area yet? Yeah, we have a um, uh, uh, flagship in and out that's going across the street from the stadium. <laughs> that's pretty exciting design. We've also had some conversations with developers about hotels um, in the district and doing um, that would incorporate more uh, pedestrian oriented design. It's, which is interesting, the projects that have been proposed have already incorporated the same principles that we're proposing with our, our documents. So everything's been aligned and we've been happy to see that. Um, we've also seen some projects for um, a parking garage, a private parking garage, um, some retail aspect, but same thing with them. They have a lot wider sidewalk and there are additional landscaping. and they're already accommodating some of those principles that we've seen. So those are some of the main ones that um, have been in the work so far that, that I'm aware of. Okay. All right, next is a monorail extension on the table at all. 
Um, the monorail was approved to extend from MGM south, and then it was there was a station that was approved uh, between the Luxor and Mandalay Bay, and so that would connect to the larger monorail system that runs mostly on the east side of Las Vegas Boulevard. I don't know the status of that, um, but that was approved a couple of years ago. Um, I think they did an extension of time to keep the entitlements active, but I'm not not aware of the construction or time frame of that if that's going to go forward at all. That's all I have at the moment. Anybody else want to put anything in the hopper for us, please? Time to something terminate here. Yeah, I appreciate everybody attending. It's a good, uh, good question so far. Right. Except for the Wolfpack one. Uh, well, <laughs> hey. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I have another one here. Okay. Uh, have there been any lessons learned from this process, from the process that will impact the development code update going on now? <laughs> That's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think if you look at transfer of Clark County, you'll see we're, it's a lot more pro mixed use with the transform Clark County and what they're trying to do. And I think a lot of the principles that are coming from this and even from the Midtown Maryland Park where that was done earlier, we all learned lessons from that are going to be incorporated into developing some of the mixed use development code uh, guidelines that come out of transform Clark County. So. Um, I think it's through these more, through these latest projects that kind of started the impetus for us to become more modernize our code to more of what today's type of development is, really. I don't know if I want to add to that. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, there's general things like, obviously we had to be really flexible once COVID hit. Um, that changed things a lot going forward. I think also, I never, I think I took it for granted how much probably us as planners know about planning and how much and how trying to have that conversation with people that are not experts in the field and have the same basis of knowledge. So whether that's people working on the project or the public, and you know, so that I think I think our Transform Clark County have done a good job um, conveying the information to um, to the public. Um, maybe we could have done a little bit better job on that. But um, I think mostly internally, uh, there are probably some lessons learned about um, working together as a group with um, uh, different um, people with different areas of expertise and bringing them together on the same page. Okay, great. Okay, next question. What impact, if any, will the people mover have on activating, activating the district? Uh, does the county think there will be uh, less of an incentive to redevelop the area if a majority of people are transported entirely underground? Um, well, I'll say more first. Will there be multiple stops proposed in the surrounding area? The stops that are on the plan now are at the Wild Wild West and the Las Vegas Stadium and the Orleans. I think those are, but. That could always change, and that with the um, the Hyperloop or the Vegas Loop project, that's pretty. You know, they they want to add and change stations constantly, so I'm sure that that could be scaled up or changed um, in that area. But I think, yeah, I mean that's true. I mean, if you're coming and going to a game by being transported there underground, you're going to lose that opportunity to walk past retail and restaurant establishments if you were walking across the Hacienda Bridge and walking over to you know the Luxor and Mandalay Bay as well. But at least it would bring people to that area. And maybe once they got out of that stadium or out of the station, you know, they would explore the area on foot. Maybe some of the immediate um, properties right adjacent to the stadium would still benefit from that station. But I mean, I do think there's obviously a, an incentive the more you can draw people between two destination destinations, you know, adjacent to those commercial uh, retail frontages, that's going to help promote more uh, commercial activity and redevelopment. Okay. Great. Okay, next question. Is there any metro substation or other increased security proposed, uh, especially by the NBA All-Star game? 
So my understanding of this part of the stadium already when we got built, they, they sent up a Metro command uh, room within the stadium already. Um, I don't know if that's uh, how it works overall for the whole stadium district, but I imagine uh, I mean, Metro was part of the our technical advisory committee too, and so they were able they follow along the plan and they're aware of uh, some of the proposals. And uh, I'm sure they'll make uh, changes to accommodations the, as they learn things as the people come to the stadium. Yeah, I think one of the things we could do as well is we already implement this on the east side of Las Vegas in Sunrise Manor. We have a requirement that when projects redevelop, they're required to install security cameras and coordinate with Metro. And that would be an easy solution if we also implemented that in this district as well um, to help improve the um, security for area or people in that area as the uses start to transition and change. So that could be something that would be pretty easy to um, implement. Okay, okay, we have another question. Aside from the obvious traffic on game days, etc., what are some of the unforeseen concerns expressed by the nearby property owners, if any? <laughs> um, I think, well, I guess the big question is, since the stadium has never been open to full capacity yet, even this past season, I think a lot of property owners are kind of concerned what will happen still, because they still don't really know. Um, I think there's concerns of uh, maybe tailgaters taking over their people's properties when maybe they don't want them. Some, I mean, some properties, but they might want them, you know, this is a, a money-making opportunity, but I think there's just a lot of, it's, it's the unknown is what people are concerned about, I guess, really. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, there's, there have, we did have some concern from property owners, um, without mentioning names, that, you know, didn't like the idea of us potentially requiring or encouraging pedestrian pathways through their site, you know, they, they're, they're fine with their industrial operations now and they may not want to redevelop. And that's fine too, we understand that, but we don't want to limit that. And, um, but you know, they, it may not be appropriate for them to have people walking through their property. Um, also, there's obviously, like Greg mentioned, huge concerns of parking and how they're gonna end up being responsible for enforcing their own parking if they want to maintain that for customers or their employees or the businesses that are operating there. And that it's not, people are not parking there. Um, and not patronizing those businesses that are just attending the stadium. And then also even our festival street idea, we got a little bit of pushback as that since on event days, um, some of the streets, you know, certain streets are gonna be closed and traffic may be, you know, in one direction or closed off completely. However, you know, our festival street idea is gonna be for non-event days. So even though those streets potentially would be closed off, we're not gonna limit access any of the developers, but that was a concern because the streets in there are going to be utilized for a lot of different purposes and access is going to be confusing until you know it's figured out. And also it's going to change with large, medium and small events and then non event days if we do festivals and things in that district. So those are some of the things that we heard concerns of from some of the property owners. Uh, just one, nothing else has come in. So more call for questions. Oh, here we go. Here. Okay. Are there next question? Are there any immediate improvements to the existing conditions, specifically as it relates to the pedestrian network in the works currently, uh, i.e., scary underpass improvements? <laughs> okay. I mean, there's the Hacienda Bridge is going to be improved. Yeah, I mean, like, there's thoughts of the Hacienda Bridge at the north side of the bridge, the sidewalk. Uh, from my understanding, it will eventually be widened to allow for more pedestrians. I think they're closing the north side of the street for now, too, the, the vehicle, so, to, for, so people can even walk on the street portion currently. Um, I think uh, I've probably heard, too, like people coming, once they go over the Hacienda Bridge, they might put some stairs going down to DMAR and Drive so they can walk underneath the bridge to get to the stadium instead of having to try to cross Hacienda itself. So uh, I think there's some plans in the works about doing that too to prevent people having to cross Hacienda once they get across I-15. All right, anything else? Yeah, the, the Raiders have done a 
they've improved the perimeter of their site already and it has a huge pedestrian walkway and landscaping around the perimeter of their site. And we're waiting for other questions. If there are any more left, we're coming to the end of our hour. Anything else? Uh, any other thoughts? Oh, you're good. Okay. Oh, I get it. We got a, okay. got a kudo. I like Thanks, that. Thank you. Those kudos are great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other honor other thoughts that may have, uh, you may have wanted to share? No, I appreciate everybody spending your lunch hour with us. Um, and opportunity for us to share this project and what we've been working on here at the county. It's been an exciting project. And so, yeah, we appreciate the questions and the feedback. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to us directly afterwards, they're more than welcome to do that. Right, so. we should have put that up on the screen, the contact information, but uh, well, I'll send that out. Uh, I'll have a follow-up email here to everybody that I've sent out to, and we can do that. And again, I just want to mention that this session will be uh, found on uh, YouTube, uh, not right away, but soon. We'll have it up and then I'll let you know where, where how to find that. So, um, yeah, so uh, any other questions or thoughts? I think we're good. Um, so thank you all for coming. And we're so glad that uh, you can be here and part of this uh, presentation because, you know, it's, I think it's pretty cool <laughs> what we're doing, what's going on. So um, anyway, uh, with that, I think we're good for the session. Thank all right, you. thanks for having us. Yeah, we'll see you at the next APA luncheon. Yep, we're going to do it again. Thanks.